All right. So I'm Kathy McAdams. I'm the assessment advisor uh, in the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment. So I work for Carrie <coughs> Crossell Jones, who is right there. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> So uh, we, we spend a lot of time looking at the different programs of assessment that our different degree pro programs have here at AU. And we see a, a lot of interesting things. Uh, so today we thought we'd let you hear from three people who've done a really good job of connecting their learning outcomes that they set for themselves sometimes years ago with, with the assessments that they're conducting and with changes that they're implementing in their programs. They're actually making the assessments that they do work for them. So many people call me up and say, what is this for? What is this for? And that's actually the topic of this presentation, is what is all this for? Having outcomes, having assessments, um, is to make these connections. And we're gonna talk about um, some, some of the really strong connections that have been made. Some of you are very familiar with the assessment cycle. It goes around and around <laughs> where you start with your red hot outcome and you do your assessment, you gather information, you look at student learning, and then you discuss it and you come to some conclusions about what's happening in your curriculum and in your classroom. You make some changes and then it all starts over. You have to assess again. As soon as you've made a change, as soon as you've made an improvement, you begin again. You begin assessing. So you're never really finished with assessing. Um, if, you're, if you're very strange, this is an interesting process to you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it actually can be very interesting. I think what you're going to hear today is interesting. We found that there are three major groups of changes people make after doing assessments. Uh, the first group is that they do sort of fine-tuning of, of their processes, um, uh, changing the way they run their classrooms, changing assignments, changing readings. A second group of changes is administrative change, changing the way you might run uh, multiple sections of a class, having a standard syllabus, standardizing outcomes across the department. Uh, it's, it's almost administrative. The third is like the, the, the crown jewel of assessment. When you realize that your curriculum needs to be reorganized and you do some curriculum change. And so your, your guests today fall into, this, into these three categories. So we've got um, um, fine tuning of teaching, these sorts of things go on. I'll go through these really quickly. Restructuring looks like this, where you might add prerequisites, set standards, and so on. And really, curriculum reorganization, uh, the BA in journalism, these are, these are programs we know have led up to curriculum reorganization with assessment. And our BA in journalism person is with us today. So Chris will be talking about the curriculum reorganization that they've done and how it is connected to learning outcomes and assessment. Um, and whenever you have a new degree, there's assessment that goes into that too. Um, our BS in chemistry and biochemistry uh, person who's here is Doug Fox, and his assessments have had to do with problem solving. Uh, these are his outcomes, and they have led to better student writing and improve safety practices in the lab. They can say, they set these learning outcomes, they assess them, and they went on to uh, make some changes. Uh, journalism, as we said, here are their learning outcomes. They've assessed these things and they have connected their assessments to new courses. And then political science has these outcomes, and they have done a variety of things. Uh, Kimberly Cal Myers is here from political science and has been instrumental in the changes that have been made in political science. So she has uh, a need to leave early, so she's actually going to go first, even though I don't have the slides in that order. Um, but you want to say hello? Sorry about that. 
So this is our mid-level, lots of administrative changes and changes in the way things are done in okay. the government department. So in, in theory, the assessment cycle is supposed to go something like, you know, you, lear you develop your learning outcomes, you develop your measure for assessing the learning outcomes, you collect the information, um, you know, sort through the data, and then you apply the lessons learned to improve your program, improve the, the ability of students to learn, or, you know, or you maybe alter the learning outcomes and you find out more about your program. Um, we're a little late to this game in government, um, and um, I, I'm not entirely confident. I want to talk about how we close the loop because I'm not really certain that we're yet at the point where I'm, I'm trusting a whole lot in the data that we've gathered because it's still a very preliminary exercise. But what I did think was perhaps useful that I wanted to share with you, and, and maybe we can generalize to some of your experiences as well, is to talk about how the process of assessment, even coming up with outcomes and coming up with assessment measures, caused us to reflect upon our program and to make changes. So um, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not within the cycle. I'm talking a little bit outside the box, as I, as I was at lunch as well. Sorry? Mm -hmm. um, so um, when we sat down to develop learning outcomes for, um, I'm, spe I'm speaking primarily about the, the BA in political science, but we're also um, running assessment for three other programs. So we have two BA programs. One is an interdisciplinary program in com communications, law, education, and government. Um, no, sorry, e economics and government, um, political science, and then a master's in political communication and a master's in political science. So, um, when we set out to develop a, m a means to assess what we were doing, we found out that assessment touches pretty much everything we do in the department. And um, it has led us to make a whole series of changes. Um, for example, we wanted, um, we wanted learning outcomes um, in the BA in political science. Um, we've, um, Kathy put a few of those up already. Um, and in doing so, we realized that we don't really have a way for our student to, to be sure that our students are getting exposed to all of this stuff, except for through <coughs> the, the common courses. God bless you. And then because our common courses, we run 10 sections of the Intro to American Politics per semester. Um, and at least in the fall semester, we, we run fewer in the spring. But we realized that we just we didn't have enough commonality across them to ensure that <coughs> our students were being exposed to the same material. So this is the idea of I mean a common syllabus, which send most of my department running and screaming from the room. But we could say, listen, all of these courses are in the Gen Ed program, and to be in the Gen Ed program, they have to address the Gen Ed learning outcomes for their foundation area. And so we ended up developing common learning outcomes for our five general education courses. Um, as well as for then our research methods course for the BA. So, so basically assessment shed light upon this sort of weakness in our program where we didn't have sufficient coordination across the different sections of the course. And we used the, the gen ed courses as the first place to begin to do that and then also with the research methods course. Um, oh, whoops, I went too far. Okay. It doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Um, Assessment also, as I said, kind of touched everything we do. It, it led us to realize that, you know, we, we understood these to be our learning outcomes, but we weren't really clear that the students understood these to be our learning outcomes. And, you know, Karen has identified that this is something that middle states pays a lot of attention to and that all of us need to kind of beef up in our own, um, in our own departments and our own programs, and that is communicating our learning outcomes to the students so that they can basically power them back. This is what our program <coughs> is about. This, this is what you will gain were you to come to our program, so for admissions purposes, um, and for our students to understand how the courses we require them to take are connected to their overall objectives and connected to the kind of the essence of the program as a whole. So um, we changed our website. We began posting our learning outcomes for our programs on the department's website, on the program website. And we revised the website. This kind of led us to look at the website and say, hey, wait a second, this sort of the interface of this doesn't make sense. And this, if a student is coming in from the outside, what do we want them to know about us? What's the story that we want to tell them? I mean, as I said, we, we're not done with the assessment loop. We're not really sure what our story is, but we're beginning to get a better sense of our identity. And that became then, you know, sort of out of sync with the image we were projecting and led us to, to revise our website. Um, we also, you know, we did some of these administrative and curricular changes. Um, it <laughs> sort of looking at it, it suddenly became apparent that we'd begun a, a 
few years before, kind of shifting the way in which we handled methods, particularly at the graduate level. I mean, you've always got the problem, do you teach them stats first, or do you teach them study design? Do you teach them study design first, and then teach them the stats? And sort of um, trying to figure out how we kind of put those things in, in lockstep became apparent to us that our methods courses were out of sequence in terms of numbering. It just didn't make any sense. Why was one this and one that? So we had to start that process. Um, we changed our methods requirements for the BA program, the political science BA, when we realized that our students were then beginning, uh, they were they were avoiding taking our methods class. Um, that became apparent when we when we said, well, aha, well, we're going to use our methods class to assess whether or not our students have methodological skills. And we realized that, you know, not enough of them, not a sufficient proportion of the major was actually taking the class in the major, or that they were, you know, trying to avoid it because it's well, nobody likes it, it's hard. Um, <laughs> so they were fleeing, and we, we ended up kind of, we, it, was a, it was an important decision to say we're going to actually require them to, to do it in-house. Um, and that means, you know, we had to, we had to staff it and, and make it available to students. Um, and um, <laughs> I'll tell you a little story on this third one, modifying the course requirements for VA concentration. So <coughs> we, um, we wanted to, you know, have some assessment exercises and we figured, well, we can sample, we don't have to, you know, do a census of all of the, um, all of our 200 majors, um, uh, you know, graduating per year, we're graduating about 200 a year, so you know, well, we can't possibly do all this, we, we have the right to sample. Um, Kathy tells me all the time I can sample in, in doing assessment. So we figured, well, well, we'll sample from each of the concentrations. And then we looked at the, co at the concentrations and said, hey, wait a second, not enough of our students are concentrating. And we, we actually had this kind of provision, and it, it's a little bit of a story, and, and it may not necessarily transcend to your own experiences, but it sort of showed again how kind of assessment shed light on some problematic features of our program. And we realized that the way in which we had set up the concentration, so students could either concentrate in a subfield or, or not, and if they concentrate in the subfield, in order to make certain that they didn't just take courses in the subfield, we required that they take a distribution of courses. Whereas we found that the, the non-concentrators didn't have any distribution requirements. So for example, if you wanted to focus on political theory, the better way to do that was to non-concentrate in political theory. Okay. And it only became obvious when we began to scratch beneath the surface and look at our numbers and add things up and talk to the advisors and say, you know, what's the scuttlebutt with the students and actually talk with some of the students and they were like, yeah, well, we figured that out two years ago. And we're like, oh, okay. So we ended up changing the way in which the concentrations are structured and the distribution requirements there. Um, ha ha, we developed a handbook. Um, we, are, we are sadly and very unfortunately highly adjunct dependent in our department. It's something that, you know, we're, we're trying to work on and have, is, is very problematic. Um, and we also rely heavily on term faculty who are, are very temporary in nature in some instances. Um, and we realized that if we <coughs> wanted to ensure that, for example, those common learning outcomes were going to be part of all the gen ed classes and all the various sections that were taught, um, and we wanted to make sure that each course, as the provost has required, has learning outcomes for that course um, and in the syllabus and we wanted to make sure that there was a statement on disability and, uh, you know, support and, you know, um, uh, academic integrity and all that sort of stuff, that we needed a, a handbook for the new faculty who were coming on and we needed a point of, of, of in w at which that all could be communicated. And so we developed a handbook for our new faculty to explain all of the department's policies and procedures and who to contact about what and where and when and, and all those sorts of things. And again, this is something that really sits outside that apparent assessment cycle but was part of the assessment process for us um, when we first started. Um, in that uh, we are required to have out learning outcomes in our syllabi, we decided that it was important for us to take a look at how that was being done across the department. And so we ran three assessments of syllabi so far, I anticipate we'll do one in the spring as well, where we looked for all of the required elements. Uh, you know, which, you know, in, in syllabus A are these five things present, in syllabus B are these five things present. And then we worked with every single faculty member who did not have all of those things present in their syllabus and asked them to revise their syllabus and repost and recirculate. So, I mean, it was, it was very time consuming. You can imagine people felt a little bit like their toes were being stepped on. Um, but it was, it was a really important part of, of developing some cohesion. And um, I'm happy to report that 
Of 80 syllabi in fall 2013, we had the majority, um, I think we had almost 95% compliance with um, the first three of those items that we regarded and we kind of rank ordered them in terms of our priorities. In other words, every syllabus had um, learning outcomes for the course in the syllabus. They weren't necessarily the best and they, you know, whatever, maybe there's, maybe there's a process there, but the point is that the, the faculty had gotten on board and they'd come to understand then what, what we needed to have present. Um, and we felt very good about that. We were able to report to the dean that, you know, we're doing it. Um, and when they said, what percentage of your syllabi have learning outcomes and, you know, have this, you know, the various policies mentioned, we could say, actually 100% of them do because we work with every faculty member to ensure. So when I'm talking about 95%, I'm talking with the initial cut. So there was very much less work for the, for um, uh, al altering, the, you know, between the first and second cuts in the last round of, of assessment because the faculty had begun to realize that this needs to be there every course, every time, you know, every semester. Um, so there's been a real learning within our <coughs> department that, again, isn't necessarily evident in the assessment cycle, but it's a good part of the process for us. Um, so you would think, one might, um, that you would start developing an assessment plan by looking at how assessment is done elsewhere. And I, I think maybe we did, but it only became more evident um, in recent months that this was something we needed to do with... Um, I, I think actually what I did was I, I looked at materials that had been produced by our, um, our professional association, American Political Science Association, on assessment. Obviously they're talking about this as well, and I had looked at their materials and um, and yet, when we went to try to pitch our plan to the faculty as a whole, when I say we, I mean the committee um, that is responsible for this in our department, we got some blowback. And, and you know, our, our colleagues said, well, who, well, who else is doing this? Oh, you know, oh, you're not going to make me do this. And, um, you know, my, my, my friends at other universities don't get to do this. Well, actually, so, so we dug in and we dug in our heels and we dug in pretty hard um, and we went and looked at all the 45 schools the university has identified as competitor and aspirational schools and we looked at their political science programs and we went back to the department with the data and we got shot down on something that I was, I was pretty adamant about but is clearly not yet popular, it's not yet endorsed by, you know, the, the, the friends of my you know, colleagues at other schools mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was useful information to have but, you know, I throw it out there to say this is a tool and it's, it's very informative and I kept saying to my department just because other schools aren't doing it doesn't mean it's not a good idea and we don't have to be followers, we can be leaders, but you know, I throw it out there as part of, um, so we went through our Rolodex basically, and that's why the Rolodex is there. We went through our Rolodex <laughs> and we did all the other schools and saw what they were up to. Um, and we did do some of this, you know, modifying the, the assignments and the exercises and the practices. We, we changed the format of the comprehensive exams, requiring an application question. We developed rubrics for everything. I mean, for, for me, the, you know, the buzzword in assessment is rubric. Um, felt rubrics for every single assignment, or, you know, every single exercise we were going to conduct. Um, and the rubric for the comprehensive exam was a very collaborative process where everybody who was evaluating or working with graduate students participated in that. Um, we, I had been running sort of a, a reception for my students and I taught the methods class at the undergraduate level um, where they presented their posters and, and sort of, you know, I'd run to Costco and get yummy <coughs> and we'd play classical music and they would dress up a little bit and we would have this kind of reception where they would invite their friends and their parents sometimes came, it was so cute, and they'd invite their faculty and we decided that this was actually something that we could use if we formalized it. And so we started to hold a poster presentation reception for all sections of this research course. So there are like four sections that we ran in the fall. <coughs> so approximately 100 <coughs> students presented their research in this format. And, um, and we seized graduate students and faculty members to use a rubric to evaluate the quality of these poster presentations so that we can talk about how our students are doing with, in terms of both quantitative skills and then also in terms of oral presentation skills. Um, we introduced a new requirement of portfolios, which I really want to throw out there and say, hey, this is a really appealing, um, appealing thing um, and maybe a tool you want to make use of in your own departments. And portfolios are sort of the, the new and very fashionable and probably very credible um, assessment tool. And that is where you ask students to put together you know, three to five of their strongest undergraduate work. And then they have as a, as a sample to show potential employers and graduate schools um, but they also take kind of responsibility for their own learning and saying, hey, this is, this is what I can do and, and this, is, this is the showcase of my, um, of my work. 
Interestingly, we could do it for one of our majors because we had a, a, a required course for all of them, and then we could just build it in as an assignment in the <coughs> course. We want to do it for the 200 majors who are graduating each year in, in political science, and we've actually hit a little bit of an administrative roadblock, but we're in the process of resolving that. It's, it's regarded as, as a significant change to our curriculum, so we're having to go through that significant change process. Um, but again, this is, and, and that requires, you know, applying through the provost office and all that. Again, these are things that assessment has sort of caused us to rethink in the department, and I, I thought they might be useful to share with you in terms of, you know, things that you might also look to or experiences you might have when you really take a hard look at, at what kind of things you want your students to learn and what kind of story you want to be able to tell about yourselves. Um, so, um, that's the end. Why? <laughs> I know you've got to run. Does anybody have a quick question for Kimberly about all that they've done in the last couple of years? I've either stunned them in the silence or bored them in tears. I'm not sure. Anybody? Anybody? All right, then we'll turn it over to Doug. Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> That's that, that sounds good. All right. Okay. Um, so, it, first of all, I, what, what, I, what I'd like to, to um, start with is um, just talking about the assessment process in general and the fact that when, when this first started in, in our department a, a number of years ago, um, there was a lot of this, I can't believe you have to do this. This, you know, what's assessing? How is this going to help us? Oh, what, you know, and then and then there were these questions of learning object. No, that's not a target. That's a, you know, something else. That's not. A, so, so there was a lot of this um, confusion over terminology and and specifically what is it that we're trying to do with these assessments. Um, a lot of the the talk I'm going to give is on specifically what it means on here. Now, in the end, it turns out that. It really is to improve your to improve your program, okay? Because a, a lot of times that was that was some of my, <laughs> that was some of my frustrating thing was early on. I was like, uh, well, well, is this what you want me to do? And it's like, well, I don't know. Is that what you want to do? Okay. What, 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 what kind of? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it turns out it, it actually is that way. It, it these the questions are being asked, and they're being asked just to make just to help us think about the program. How can we make it so that our students are learning what we want them to learn? Um, our particular uh, uh, learning objectives, unfortunately, I, I don't have the act specific list. I, I can post that. Are these I've PowerPoints yeah. presented uh, later? You can put them up on, on uh, the Blackboard. Okay, so, so I'll actually put the, the full uh, assessment plan that we have, the, you know, the, the actual report that will be fine. That will list all the the um, the actual objectives with it. Um, the our objectives though are, are broad. It's not a uh, we want them to learn this specific aspect of chemistry. No, it's just it, can they use chemistry and apply it to something new? Can they conduct experiments? It's something very general like that that you can apply practically every course to. And you can then use different aspects of the course to kind of help you uh, achieve that learning objective. Okay, so um, so the first thing is, is I, as some of this writing is also for those of you who actually have to write the reports. So one of the things that makes it helpful is if you make it very succinct dis descriptions, things that are short but very descriptive. Um, and importantly, have a clear schedule or cycle. And I found this out in year three when I was like, I used to have, oh, in year three, we're going to do this. And I was like, okay, what year is it? Is it three? Is it four? Boy, I don't remember anymore. So, so, so I now actually put, you'll see I have an actual date that's listed right here every four years. And I put the, the date with, I, I don't need year eight anymore, but um, it, that way I know, oh, okay, during the 2016-2017 academic year, I'm going to be doing this particular assessment, okay? So um, this is the assessment plan part where we have an assessment measure on the left. This is how we're going to evaluate. Are they actually making the learning objective? This is the target. <coughs> this is a type of specific target. We'll, I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, and then the schedule and cycle. 
The other thing is, I have descriptions. In the past, I used to say things like, I want a 5.5 out of 7 on student evaluations of teaching number 103. It's like, okay, well, what's 103? I have to go back and look it up. So now, at least, I, I put a short description that identifies what that is. It's good understanding of concepts. Now I know specifically what is it that that is going to help us assess. Now, in this particular case, um, so, uh, actually on this one, so I can go to the next one. Okay, so one of the things that we found is as we're doing these assessments, as we're, as we're uh, developing different ways to kind of uh, determine uh, how are they uh, doing better at writing or how are they doing better at doing lab type of work, um, we get an unexpected result that we weren't, that we didn't anticipate. We had a departmental review from the ACS and um, I had forgotten that at the time we were asked to submit some, la some laboratory report examples. So the report comes back and they're talking about the program and are we meeting expectations and they have comments in there, oh by the way your students are not doing very well on these aspects of writing. Okay, so, so that, it's like it's a result now of an assessment that I was normally wasn't going to do. So you can get these unexpected results and they can be beneficial. Um, in this particular case, the, the, the review indicated student work should be improved. The emphasis they were doing was on formatting, on doing type of research. So in this one, this is now talking about assessment results rather than the plan. So the columns here is you first do, as you did the assessment, whatever your targeted assessment was, um, that's on the left. What was the result? What did you find? Then how did you use it? and then a follow-up. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the difference between the three. You'll notice that on this bottom one, I don't have any result, okay, because, uh, or excuse me, any use, because sometimes it's just a result, and sometimes I'm not going to use it. Other times I'm going to use it, and I'm not going to have a follow-up. So it, recognizing how each one of these, and, and you think about that, that's what you normally do with assessment, right? You get a result, sometimes you say, well, it's a result, but I'm not going to, it has no need at this time. So it, again, if, you, if you're thinking of it in terms of this, it, it can help you actually improve your program and use it in a way that it was intended to do. So uh, in this particular case, what we did is, um, based on that, assessment that they weren't doing very well on referencing, um, we ended up doing, uh, let's see, this one was, uh, part of it is we had developed a new laboratory sequence and this laboratory sequence allowed them to do research. We started adding a different type of uh, writing assignment in it and I don't, I don't think I have it listed on this one but one of the all results we also did is we had a librarian come in in the second week and talk about how do you reference work. How do you look it up? How do you research it in order to put it into your program? So that is something that we were able to use out of that result. Um, whoop, went too far there. Okay, so um, you can use a, a result differently for each learning outcome. So sometimes, uh, you know, early on it was uh, identify, okay, we're going to do this assessment and what learning outcomes does it, uh, is it attached to? And, and when these first came out, there was a column type of a three, three column table thing that, that was de designed um, and in that aspect when you did it that way it, you think about it a little differently than if you're looking at each learning outcome specifically and I'm just going to look at the one learning outcome and see all the different assessments that are attached to it and so that's what this one is doing so uh, the same result that you have can be used for a different learning outcome so in this one the ACS review whereas before I mentioned that uh, we have extra writing assignments. In this one, we now have the uh, uh, librarian coming in and giving us a little talk on it. So that's showing how that one result is used for two different learning objectives. Um, okay, so result use or follow-up. This is the, the example that I was talking about. I, I talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, you'll notice that with these dates that are listed here, you can, you can identify in some cases I have a result <coughs> that came in immediately, I used it, and then I possibly have a follow-up because I I'm, I'm want to describe something that I had over here. Um, usually that's not the case. Usually the follow-up will come after, like in this one, okay, where 
Um, we had future courses may require data, so now I'm going to follow up on that. I said it may do it. Now I need to say yes, it has been replaced. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a flow chart to kind of say I can look at my use of finding and then do a follow up on it if I left it as a question. Um, don't be afraid to scrap ineffective ones. Okay, there's a large number of ones that we had. Uh, there's a few of them that we've actually scrapped. Um, some of them, like we, we were uh, had ACS standardized tests, uh, we ended up not doing. Uh, we weren't getting any standardized tests. Um, just it was it was difficult to get uh, at the time. Um, I don't remember exactly why, but we haven't been using standardized tests, so it's like it, you can't use it as an assessment measure if we're not giving it to the students. So uh, you know, so so we ended up uh, uh, eliminating things like that. Um, we we also had another one. Um, I, I think I have it listed later on, but um, I, I had one where um, I, again I was trying to do something with online notebooks where we could review online notebooks and see how well are they actually able to conduct experiments. It turned out to be too daunting for the for the faculty members to have to go through everything and did they actually do it and and did they indicate in there that yes indeed they had to repeat an experiment. Um, so we scrapped it and we just. It, you know, don't be afraid. Sometimes those assessments are not the right way to do it, and that's and that's part of this is it's a learning process. Um, use the reviews to your advantage. I, this goes back to what I said initially. Um, sometimes I get these reviews, and I'm like, but I'm doing everything right. Why is this negative? Okay, it, it's not always negative. Sometimes it's just, have you thought of it in this way? Um, and if you take a step back, it can actually be very useful. Um, in some cases, recognize that some of these reviews are, are you, you know, they're, they're being done quickly, they're being done from a perspective of, of, well, this isn't the way I would have done it. And it's kind of like a, even though it might be written tersely or written in a way that, that it might seem like, oh, they're, they're bashing my idea, don't look at it that way. Think of it instead of, of this is a, something that I can use out of it. So uh, as an example, in, in this one, one of, one of the, the reviews, um, it had said the associated target is 80% or better on the discussion sections of the written research laboratory reports. Um, and then it, it, the, the review re, um, suggested that we clarify it. Um, and so uh, as an example, what we did is we said, um, well, I thought I had it on this one. It must be on a different one. Um, I think it was on the last one, actually. Okay, well, I'll... I'll the, the, I got confused because I had a number of things that said 80%, so I must have cut and pasted the wrong one. Um, but this shows you what I had said earlier about the examination uh, changing, going from a, a laboratory sequence into review of preliminary calculations. Um, the, the one thing I can say is down here, what, one of the things that we did is instead of 80%, we said four out of five on specifically these two items that are on a presentation score sheet. Um, I'm going to get into the presentation score sheet because it actually is very useful um, and, and you'll see why in just a little bit. But that way, it's now a very specific way of actually identifying what is 80% or better. It's according to this uh, type of rubric. Uh, one of the things that we found as we were doing the assessment um, is we were noticing that students just were not being safe in the lab. and um, numerous type of violations, people not wearing goggles, you know, and we're sitting there in the faculty meeting and it's like, now wait a minute, that, that's an assessment, that's, that's a learning objective. We want these students to know how to be safe. So that got incorporated simply because we noticed something in, in the lab and because assessment is always on our mind, because we're always being asked to do assessments, <laughs> It, it, it allowed us to actually put it in there and to now focus on it and come up with rubrics to kind of help out and, and plans that we can use to improve that. So we're just starting with this. Um, I am starting another rubric with this. I just have it on a, uh, um, a simple uh, uh, handwritten sheet at this point, so I don't have anything to present on that one. I, I can put, though, um, that one of the things that I did because of safety was on my mind with it. A faculty member came up with this. This is, this is a, a method that they're using to identify is the student um, qualified enough to do a particular experiment on their own. 
asking the student to go out and actually look at what are the different safety problems or safety potential safety issues that you have with an experiment. And then based on the rankings, um, there's a way of identifying, well, this first one is not going to be done at all. The second one, uh, maybe uh, with the, the faculty member there, um, and eventually having the student working up to, to being able to do it on their own. So what I did is I just used this to present to some of the uh, master students and to see um, how where are they thinking of safety and um, they didn't do very well. Okay, so it so came back. You know, I told, I warned, I said, I said, no, I'm not grading it, right? I just want to know how how much you're thinking about the safety, and it was still they, they didn't put any effort into it, and it's like, okay, well, that's not good. So that's something that we're working on and, um, right now is uh, finding ways to improve safety in the lab. Um, student evaluations can help. It's not the only thing, um, but it is helpful in identifying things like uh, in, in this is the, the assessment. I have it on the back sheet of this uh, if you want uh, a copy of this. But an example would be um, which instruments did you use in the spring semester that were not used in the fall? So it's now um, asking have you been able to use what you learned earlier and apply it to something new? Apply it to are you feeling comfortable enough to do conducting of experiments that you can move forward? If they're putting no here, then I, I, I can say, you know, we're not quite where we want to be. We want them to be able to take on a new project and not be afraid of it, not be afraid to try that, that something new. Um, the other things uh, uh, like uh, uh, which lecture courses help you with the background so that way we can identify which particular courses um, would be most applicable for uh, putting in other type of assessments. So a student evaluation can be very helpful um, in, in future type things. It can also provide student mood. One of the things that uh, we've, we've heard uh, in, in other type of sessions is uh, how, how good of a sense of community do students have. So by simply asking how well did you like it, um, would you recommend it to someone else, are you interested in it even though you, it's not required for you, it gets kind of a, an idea of how well um, do they actually like the course, are they, are they liking the program. Um, the thing that, that was really helpful as far as identifying how well students did is I want to get all the faculty involved in doing assessments and helping out with this. I don't want to be the only one or having one or two. How do I get more input from them and get it so that it's not daunting? If I ask them to just look at a, at a, at a paper and tell me what do you think about the discussion section, are they applying different things? They're going to look at it and go, I don't want to do this for all these different presentations, for all these different papers. So I came up with what would be trying to give it in just a number. So even if it's qualitative at the time, over an average, it will be helpful in identifying are they improving, are they, um, is, is one particular section, is their, is their analysis going to be worse off than their organization? It, it helps us identify what aspects it is, is uh, um, needed for improvement and it's minimal time for the faculty who don't want to work on it. I mean, how hard is it to review it and at this point say, well, yeah, 80%, four. Okay, that's not very hard and it does give you valuable information that you can use for assessment. So I really like these type things when you're getting um, some kind of resistance from faculty from, from I, I don't have enough time to do this. So if you design something properly, it can go very fast. And that's one of the things that I'm working on right now with the safety sheet is something that is quick and still meaningful. Okay, and, and, and I think that's key for kind of yeah. getting data. Can you yeah. mention, do you share that rubric with your students? Did they get to I, see it? No, I, I have not at this time. Okay. I didn't mention I, that because I, 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 when I do my classes, sometimes people are wondering what they're really looking for. Right. And it's amazing how sharing a rubric can get students focused on uh, making sure that they're right. What, what the, the main thing, because because I use this also, I can use this one for both written assignment and oral. Okay. And, and 
One of the things is when I'm doing oral, students freak out when I pull it out, okay? So, so and pass it to the other faculty members. And I, and I, I, I tell the students, I say, don't worry. What we're doing is grading ourselves. Because that's what we're doing. We're grading how well do we teach them. Um, I, I have not, I, I mean, that, that would be a, 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 you know, a good suggestion, especially to do it early. I, I don't think I'd want to do it that day that I'm pulling it out. No, no. Because, you know, then they're going to they're gonna try and, you know, um, make it, oh, see, I did this, right? You know, and it, so. You can spend all day. Yeah. You probably better okay. go to crib. Okay. So that was it. Okay, I, I do have a summary that you can kind of look at. Great, and I so hope this is on. Is it? Is it? A, it'll. You know, we've got a site. I can put it on the site. That would yep. be. Yep. Great. Thank. Okay. Thank you very much. And you can see how it just goes and goes. You just keep. It. And your presentation rubric looks a lot like Kimberly's. Yeah. The one that she developed for the political science poster okay. presentation looks very okay. similar. So now we'll talk about the crown jewel, which well, is I curriculum mean, change. <laughs> the crown jewel. Let me get your learning outcomes up here. Well, I have to say, probably like a lot of you, I was sort of thrown into this idea that I was supposed to do outcomes and assessment with <coughs> the journalism division. I'm in the School of Communication. We have uh, four divisions there. So I was specifically charged with looking at journalism. And I have to say, you know, I didn't know anything about outcomes and assessments, which maybe a lot of you, and, you know, and I thought, well, what does this really mean? And as I've come to realize, and as um, Doug said, it's a big help in terms of just determining how your program is going. I also need to say that probably you all are aware, but journalism is, has, is, continues to change every day. So we have a big challenge in our profession in trying to keep our students, um, you know, up to date with the changes going on. And you all are aware that changing curriculum is difficult. It's not, you know, something that you can turn around and do the next week. So I have, you know, the more I got involved in outcomes and assessments, I totally realized that this is something to say to the faculty, if we assess what we're teaching, it will help us figure out what our students need when they graduate. Um, okay, so I was just given sort of outcomes that the faculty had come up with before I even came on board full time. Um, and these are most yeah, the others are a little bit more in detail, I think, but that's the general summary of them. So initially what I did is I just went to faculty and said, what are you teaching? Um, I'm going to assess the course. And of course they first were like, oh, no, we don't want you doing that. But then, you know, I explained, <laughs> I, it's all anonymous and, you know, just give me papers. I asked for papers and exams and things. And then I had other faculty, I got a little committee together and I said, let's look through this. But here's exactly what he said. I came up with rubrics because people do not want to spend the time on this. For every course I assessed, I gave the faculty a rubric. And, you know, just saying, are we training them in digital skills? Are we training, are they learning core journalism ethics? You know, things like this. I gave them a list. I said, I could just go one to five. Are the papers showing that the students are coming away with this result? Okay. So I did it for two or three different classes, mostly sort of looking at our skills. We, we separate our courses sort of as learning, you know, actual journalism skills, writing and recording, digital um, broadcast, broadcast multimedia skills. And then we have broader, what I would call theory classes, like journalism, communication law, ethics, media studies, things like that. So. Um, you know, I have to say the skills classes, most of the students, I mean, we saw the work they were doing. I could look at, you know, their uh, multimedia projects. I looked at blog sites and things, the students' websites and things, students. And I think the faculty as a whole, as a whole felt, you know, we were kind of on track. Okay, well then a couple of things happened. We asked uh, one of our faculty, and she'd been doing this over a number of years, actually gave the graduating seniors an exit survey. I would highly recommend this if you can do it. It's very eye-opening. Um, and, you know, they should just went to the senior classes. They, and again, it was like a form. They filled out about how they had learned, what they had learned. Did they feel they get, got a good education from us and from our program? 
And I, what really jumped out at us is overall they were happy, but they did not feel well prepared for the new role of journalism in society. I think mostly they felt they didn't have the technical or digital skills necessary. I mean, some of this is now, you know, journalism has gone from typewriters to people using their phones. I mean, that's, you know, most journalists today do their work on their phones. So this is a dramatic thing for us to, you know, move them over there. But they still have to have these fundamentals. I mean, if they can't write a lead or a story, they're not going to get a job. So it's a, it's a difficult for us. Anyway, from this exit survey, and the fact that we were looking at our curriculum, I did up an assessment and said we have got to add more skilled digital multimedia skills classes pretty much at the sophomore level because by the time they're sophomore junior level, well then we ran into this whole thing and that many of them go abroad junior year so we were missing you know half of them. So anyway, um, and we began to change our curriculum. So we um, have come up with Suggestions, could, well, we did change both. This is basically for the, the BA, and um, we've added two more, what I would call skill levels classes at the sophomore level. We're dropping uh, some of our writing classes more into the freshmen so that they have more consistent writing through the four years. Um, and one other thing I did, which I would highly recommend, is for the division director, I did a, a curriculum map. And I took every one of our outcomes and I said, here are the classes we teach that fulfill these outcomes. You know, some were, they were, should have not, you know, we should not teach them anymore. They're outdated or whatever. And then we needed new ones, particularly to address sort of the professional skills or the digital skills. So, um, so the BA, we came have come up, we're still sort of, trying to get a sequence of the courses, but it's definitely affected sort of our overall look at the BA. And then we went ahead and also changed, I don't have the outcomes here for the master's program, but be, again, partly as a, uh, because we see our profession changing, we divided the master's program into three specific um, areas, more like um, study areas, or we would say beats even, on um, investigative reporting, international reporting, and broadcast reporting. Because today, students do need more specialized, particularly at the graduate level. Um, so I guess my suggestion would be, oh, and the other thing I would like to say, and it's true, this is middle states like this one. We're accredited by something called the AGEMC, which is the Journalism and Education. They really like outcomes and assessments and we're in the process of putting together this reaccreditation now and the fellow in charge of it said to me to be able to go and say to them, look, we're really looking at our program and what our students <coughs> need. Well, it's what we should be doing anyway, I guess. So it, it absolutely has impacted our curriculum and um, hopefully will continue to, I think, unless I'm Collapse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone has any questions on that. And that, and I think curriculum change was inevitable, yeah. but the your assessments guide. Exactly. exactly right. And I, I thought it helped you all feel very secure in what you were doing. Yeah. That you were doing the right, the right thing. And the thing is, I keep saying you can change your outcomes. Don't I? I sometimes feel like, well, our faculty was so wedded to these outcomes. But I'm like, you know, we can change them. We can say, no, they need more multimedia skills. So don't, I think that can, I'm right on that. It's a living thing. You're, right. you're out, well, like adding the safety outcome. And I also have some examples of rubrics, uh, if people are interested. They just definitely help because we all are too busy. And if you can just do it quickly, it, it, it does help. And as Doug pointed out, it might not be exactly a four out of five, but that variance from year to year, when you see the students getting better and better, it, it, it'll tell right. you that. Yeah. It will track the changes. Or even course through a curriculum. Right. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'll just make a couple comments because one of the things I noticed about all three of them, that, you know, I, I know a lot of people are probably also interested in terms of assessment, not at the program level, but at the course level. And um, I think there's a couple, there's a lot of lessons learned from what we've done at the program level that, that these folks demonstrate. Um, one is um, the importance of having course assignments and, you know, that track to your learning outcomes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that instead of having a lot of assignments or work done, it's not necessarily directly tied, the more that you can have assessments in your course tied to the specific learning outcomes so that students know why you're doing a particular thing. Um, you know, all three of these folks have really done a great job of really fine-tuning that. And for a lot of programs, they began by doing assessments just because they figured they could have an assessment. But it wasn't necessarily tied specifically to the learning outcome. So you get all this data back, and then you'd say, okay, but it's all about stuff that's not important to me. And so the key really in a course or in a program is what these folks have done is really think strategically about what, how the assessment is tied to the learning outcome. Like Doug said, and some of the changes that you might do with an assessment, um, some assessments may fall out or come back in, depending on whether or not they really tie to the learning outcomes. The other thing that all three of these folks <coughs> did is they learned from their assessments and adapted their learning outcomes accordingly. So in your course syllabus, you may have you know, five learning outcomes or something, the things that you want folks to learn. And in the process of teaching the course, if you start noticing that there are things that students are just not doing well, like safety, for example, um, you know, maybe to use that example in some of the chemistry classes, they weren't actually emphasizing safety. It maybe it was less, or maybe they were emphasizing it, but it wasn't listed as one of the learning outcomes. So students weren't making that connection, but that was something that was really important. And certainly, like Chris said, you know, you may actually change your learning outcomes in your syllabi. You should really be thinking about changing your learning outcomes in your syllabi or in your program if you're finding that there's something um, that's missing. And um, <clears throat> the other thing that you'll notice is that they've all, we've all been talking really about program outcomes and probably everybody in here are teaching courses and so making that link, like Chris said, the, we call it curricular mapping. Like if you, if you have certain things in your program that, are, that you really want students to learn, well, hopefully they're being taught someplace, right? Um, there, we have a lot of great examples here at AU where folks, the faculty actually set the program learning outcomes and said, oh, these are great learning outcomes, but we're not actually teaching anymore. <laughs> um, and you know, that's but as faculty members, it's really good to be kind of in tune to think about how the stuff that you do at your course level are tying to the learning outcomes for the overall majors in your program. And if you're finding that you have a required course or you're teaching a required course and it's not really linking or syncing really well to the program outcomes, that's a chance to either be an advocate for changing the learning outcomes for your program or making some adjustments to the course so that they so that they think a little better. I, well, <clears throat> one of the things I'll I'll, I'll post is, is our uh, um, the the syllabi we have for our general chemistry course. Okay, because those were the first ones where it was asked not only to have a learning out of not only have a learning outcome on it, but also have the assessment that goes with it. Okay, and eventually that's going to be for all the courses. And you'll see on there that there are some things, some of them are tied to a learning objective. Some of them are course specific. Some of them, some of the learning objectives are not on them, okay? Because it, it, it's kind of a mix with that. So as you kind of go through courses, don't think, you know, that you have to change it so that everything matches. It's not going to, okay? And, and in some, as long as there's just one kind of connection or even a foundational, right? It doesn't even have to be a, um, this connects directly to the learning objective, but I know they need to know this so that in the next course they do something that actually links you to the learning objective. So, yeah, curricular mapping is a <coughs> terrific idea. Does anybody have questions for uh, for Doug or for Chris? So, 
really good example of how assessment can guide you. Anybody? Yes. I, I have a more general question really about at the course level conducting assessment. So Chris, I think you touched on this mm -hmm. issue of um, student self-evaluation is one way, but it's not right. the whole way. Right. And you also described, both of you described how you have rubrics for faculty. So when you're the faculty, you know, I struggle sometimes both with the issue of, um, you know, using my own judgment about what they need and assessment of what, uh, what was required rather than just what their self-evaluation is because they may not know that they need such and such, you know, uh, or uh, sort of that issue. And then uh, sort of a separate issue, maybe Karen or Kathy, maybe you're, you're going to talk a little bit to this, is when you have learning outcomes that have sort of intangible, yes. you know, that are difficult to assess. So what are some tools that you might suggest for thinking about how to assess those? So, so uh, I can at least address part of the first one, okay? If it's quantitative, okay, then that you're type of like an exam. You could find a problem on that exam that you wrote with that, that learning objective in mind. And then you could just say what, how are they scoring on that one, on that one problem, mm -hmm. and then see, you know, and, and making sure that just every, either every exam or every time you teach the course, you have a problem that is associated with that, mm -hmm. and then you now you can track it, and now you can, even though in general they say, you know, in in general reviewers tend to frown upon exams. If you're specific like that and picking a particular problem that you know absolutely addresses that, it's a great way to assess it. So that, that's one way that you can do it as an individual. When you have something in mind, I mean, certainly when I'm writing exams, I have that in mind. Okay, this is what I want them to learn by assigning this problem. Well, then that problem becomes your assessment. I would say one other thing, too, that I've uh, actually encouraged our faculty to do, and this is just more of a general thing. I mean, I have required that every syllabi have outcomes. And I, I say the last day of class, you should stand up and, and say to the class, here are the outcomes on the syllabus, and you, I should have taught you all these things. You should have learned these outcomes, because this is what this, class, this course was about. And I, I love them, because it does sort of keep you on track as you're teaching. Like, oh yeah, they're supposed to be, you know, have critical thinking in the area of such and such, and I should better be sure they're learning that. So Maybe on the first day of class. And on right? um, both, yeah. actually, yeah. And when you go through the syllabus, I say, here's what, here's what you should get from this course. What uh, You know, you're paying for this, you should get this. And then the last day of class, I say, okay, I think we did all this. I hope, you know. Oh. Anyway, so. That's an old journalism thing. You tell them what you're yeah. going to tell them, mm -hmm. then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> and it makes sense. I mean, sometimes they are sort of surprised, like, oh, yeah, we learned yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's good. On your intangibles question, um, I worked with philosophy this fall, and that she said they're just reading differently. I don't know what it is. It, it's something that they're doing. It feels different to me. I don't, you know, can you just come over and see if you can measure it? You know, we don't know what it is, but can you measure it? And I taught, I had a focus group with the students, and then I had them <coughs> write just one sentence about the most important thing they had gotten out of their philosophy class, and it just rolled out. They said, I know how to read something that is hard to read. I know how to read slowly instead of quickly. You know, they gave her exactly... So sometimes they can, if you if you work with them, they can tell you. Qualitative. Yeah. That's right. Some qualitative work, and and what she and I are doing is picking key words and looking for them. Yeah, it's a big mistake. It's oftentimes mm -hmm. people think that for for assessments to be meaningful, it has to be quantitative. It has to be an exam where you can say that the student got an 87 versus a 97. And the truth of the matter is that um, faculty need to, to, to trust their gut. 
in terms of what are the evidence that they uh, you know, need to know whether or not a student has gotten something. Now sometimes, mm -hmm. if it's something like an appreciation for something, you know, mm -hmm. that's not going to be, you're not going to find that on a test. And to ask the student, do you ha now have an appreciation for X, you know, a 9 out of 10 say yes, is not exactly the kind of evidence that you're looking for. You know, but in those kind of cases, um, having students to journal, to reflect, right. you know, on a regular basis, taking a look at that to see whether or not the student's reflections demonstrate appreciation, you know, um, are opportunities, you know, that you can look for. So, what I would say is if there's ever a question, like you know that there's something you really want to teach, um, uh, to either work with our office for examples of assessment methods or to work directly with CTRL because CTRL, you know, one of their strengths is really helping faculty find <coughs> um, assessments that will work for particular things that they're trying to get at. But I, I would encourage you not to try and stick that um, square peg into the round hole to say that, you know, if it's not something that's meaningful to you and you're doing it just to get a result, it's probably not the, the right thing. And conversely, I would say don't shy away from having learning outcomes that you think are difficult to assess. And if you have a feeling like that, like she just felt their learning was different, it, go for it. You know, it doesn't have, you can put it in your assessment plan. You know, you saw how flexible these documents are. Anybody have a question? Anybody having any challenges in particular with assessment in either their courses or their program or um, an example of something that you're finding a challenge? Do you feel like your faculty are, are buying into it? Because I found at first that some faculty that like those said, we're like, we're not doing this. Well, they also feel, I think, if you're saying we're assessing your course, that they take it sort of personally, like, oh, you're, you're checking up to see how I'm teaching. And I say, no, it's all anonymous, you know, it's all, you know, it's random, we just take papers and things. But there, there is that element of it, I think, that they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to get a bad mark on this. Uh, I did basic statistics and mm -hmm. one of the challenges that I faced was when do I bring in technology? You know, in statistics sometimes you are faced with a huge data set and you need technology to be able to find the mean, the variance. <coughs> At the same time, I want them to understand the concept of what these numbers mean, what are they. And when you introduce the technology, they tend to shy away from how to compute where the understanding is. So my question then, what I find myself in is to have to balance the technology with the core concepts such that I give to them the, the clear meaning of what I want to convey. At the same time, they benefit from the technology. So now, what I came up with was the sequence by which I teach certain concepts. Sometimes I have to teach this one first and then assess in some form of quizzes or something. Yeah. And then later on, then I do the technology aspect. And then somewhere at the end, I say, oh, I, I, I will require this one, not that one. But it was a big challenge that I, if I go the technology way, they won't get to understand the core concept. If I go the core concept, the real world say use technology to compute the results. So then where do I draw the balance? And it was a challenge for a while, but later I found, I found my theory. And sometimes those things are... are and you have that listed on your syllabus that these are things that they should yes, come so away with? Yes, yeah, I have a yeah. outcome, mm -hmm. but they were not too discreet, but it's just... You know, you yeah. do the technologies, you do this, there will be a technology aspect of the course. So even my, I have three tests before the finals, and test one is more of the technologies, test two is more of the mathematical, you know, computation, and test three is more of technology, where you have to use technology to do almost everything. Time. And I think you'd want to assess them separately. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One of the things you'll notice that they did too is, <coughs> Um, using assessment not just to say, okay, the student learned it or didn't learn it, but to use assessment as a way to get for you kind of an information gathering way for you to figure out what's working in your class and what's mm -hmm. not. So sometimes if, in planning assessments, if you can find a twofer, you know, mm -hmm. things that will not only get you a student grade, but will give you some information that will say, I taught it, did they get it? Or what parts of the stuff that I taught do they actually get? Um, that also sometimes can be a helpful way of deciding how you want to do your assessment. 
Yeah, one more question. Oh, I'm going to add just one quick comment if you don't yeah. mind. And then yeah. we even went for a three firm. So we've used some tools that we use for student learning in the classroom. So not only with the <coughs> assignment, then we have some student grade, we might take an excerpt and assess one learning outcome and then a different excerpt and assess another learning outcome. So we even assess more than one learning outcome with that particular assignment. So you can combine and synergize to get a total picture. So I'm sorry to jump in. And those of you who are interested in a te text, a test of knowledge, of core knowledge, COGAI has developed their own test of core business knowledge, and they did it with their own faculty. So they really have some great methods going on in COGAI that some of you might want to know about. One thing I include in my syllabi is a column. I have you know, the, the weeks and the, uh, you know, the readings and the cases, and then I have the deliverables. I include a column that I call the toolbox. And I teach a code guide, so mm -hmm. I teach a quantitative and qualitative mm -hmm. tools, and I identify the tools that the students are going to leave the class with. So it's sort of a way of taking the learning outcome and say, you're going to learn this is a concept, and I, look, I use like a key icon for concepts, and then I use a, I think it's a hammer and a wrench that's crossed <laughs> to show the quantitative. And that gives them an idea of the, here's the skills that you're going to leave this mm -hmm. class with. So it's a little bit less abstract than learning outcomes. But for the first couple of years I taught, I, I referred to a toolbox as a metaphor. And now I actually say, here's your toolbox. And at the end of the semester, you look at that column, some of the classes, there's, there's quite a few tools that they leave it. And again, I distinguish between quantitative and qualitative oh, tools. That's great. It's been pretty successful with yeah. that. Approach. Well, we could do that actually in journalism. It's yeah. very sure. similar mm -hmm. in that sense. Certain skills they need, it, and then they'll yeah. understand not how to Yeah. Well, we're going to learn how to be critical thinking, we're going to learn how to do right. whatever. It's very more concrete. Okay. Well, you all have been a great audience, and of course, we'll be here for a few minutes trying to untangle all our technology. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, if you've got questions, please come forward and otherwise have a great dessert and rest of the day.